Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this uh, service on Zoom, uh, courtesy of the Noon Baptist Church. It's good that you're able to join this morning as we continue the series that we're looking at throughout the Old Testament. We've got up on the screen at the moment the Old Testament outline that we're following, and uh, we had finished with this section here, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, and we're moving on to this section here, covering the time remaining in Egypt and the exodus from Egypt. We're working with these key themes. It doesn't mean that each time we look at the Old Testament in this way and through our, our plan um, that we're looking at all of these, but there should be in each of them um, some of these key themes appearing. Um, the first one is it's God's history. God is working to a plan. There's nothing random about the way he is operating. He is working to a plan. The second thing is that uh, there's a total difference between ourselves and God. Um, our sin is the thing that makes us different and separates us from God and caused us to lose our place with God from the very start. So we're nothing like God. But God intensely desires to have relationship with us. God is a God of love. And he reaches out to us from every page of the scriptures, um, revealing himself in this way that he wants to draw us near and bring us into his family. He intensely desires a relationship with us. Um, there's a tension um, in the, the, between mercy and justice. I, we know of a God of mercy who's merciful and who uh, still has to be just. And that tension exists all the time. And God wants to be fair uh, and at the same time to be merciful. God makes and keeps promises and covenants. We've looked at that in past Sundays. The covenants that he's made with various people, the Abrahamic covenant and so on. And a, any promises that God makes, he keeps them. God is true and sure. What he says, he will do. And that gives us a great assurance. And then finally, everything in the scriptures is pointing towards the Messiah. Speaking of the one who will come and who will redeem people unto God, and that's God's plan. So we're looking at these uh, themes as we work our way through the Old Testament, but this morning, I think probably we're majoring more on the first and the last. God has a plan and works to a plan, and everything in that plan is pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the timeline that we're following, and we um, were over here on the right um, and looking at Isaac, Jacob and Joseph. And then there's a, a considerable period here, three, maybe even 400 years uh, up to the point that we're looking at now, the Exodus in the early chapters of the book of Exodus um, about Moses and his call and the redemption of the people from Egypt. So that's where we are today. We're in this section here, and we've made an outline that we can follow um, through the first 15 chapters of Exodus, and we've named them uh, on the, on the left-hand side there, um, and we've just worked our way through these just to remind ourselves of um, <clears throat> the story of the Exodus and then consider its implications. So the link between the final talk with Joseph um, and our study today would come in uh, Exodus chapter one um, and verse eight. And this is what the word of God says. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply and if war befall us, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. 
So this is the start of the, uh, the study that we're looking at this morning, the, the enslavement of the people. The people who had come down, Jacob and his family initially, um, at uh, the invitation of uh, Joseph and the way in which Pharaoh allowed them to go and live in the land of Goshen, they came as uh, shepherds, uh, a pastoral people, um, and uh, they established themselves there. And over this period of three or 400 years, multiplied greatly. Um, and this was the cause of concern to this new Pharaoh, that they were becoming rather a large people. And so they were enslaved. And instead of being a, uh, a pastoral people looking after sheep, uh, they became almost an industrial society because they were brought into the construction industry and their job was to make bricks. Um, so there was a, a, a dramatic change there in uh, the way of life. No longer free people, but enslaved. No longer pastoral shepherds, but working to make bricks. And it was in that um, harsh environment, they were under taskmasters who ensured that the work was done. Uh, in that harsh environment, they were extremely unhappy and they cried out to God, looking to God for help. Uh, we don't get much information about the formality of worship uh, during this period, but certainly the individuals that had an understanding of, of God were crying out to him, looking for a way out, a way forward. And it was in this situation that um, God himself says, I heard their cry and moved into action with his plan. He had already um, placed Moses in a position of authority in the um, e Egyptian court. And he was familiar with the ways there. But due to other circumstances, he had to flee that. And he ended up being a shepherd himself in the land of Midian. And it was there that God was wanting to call him back into action <clears throat> and bring him back into play. Um, this is the incident of the burning bush. Um, bushes in that, that dry, arid environment um, would often go on fire. But the difference here was that the one that Moses was looking at wasn't being burned up. It was fire within the bush. And the word of God says he, he stepped aside to, to, to look at it, to see it. And out of that, um, the Lord spoke to him and gave him his call. I want you to go back to Egypt. I want you to be the one who affects the, the uh, release of my people from their slavery and to bring them up and out of Egypt. And initially Moses is uh, reluctant um, for various reasons, um, I'm sure. Um, however, with encouragement and with also the addition of his brother Aaron to go with him, uh, he goes back to Egypt. And there he confronts Pharaoh with um, God's request, let my people go. And uh, that, falls on deaf ears. And so the plagues follow in chapters 7 to 11. Um, distressing times for the Egyptians. And each time they are moved, but not moved enough to uh, let the children of Israel go. Until we get to the last plague, where the death of the firstborn uh, of the Egyptians and their livestock takes place. And this initiates, uh, we've had enough of, of these uh, people, let's get rid of them. And, and they almost chased them uh, out of Egypt. And uh, uh, this, uh, this time it was, uh, the Passover was established. And we see uh, the sacrificial lamb appearing a, in the scriptures, and the one who would follow right through, um, right up to Revelation. And we speak of uh, Jesus as being the Lamb of God. So the Passover is established at this time, and it has so much meaning now uh, for Orthodox Jews continuing to celebrate Passover uh, in the way that uh, it was established then. But it also should mean quite a lot 
uh, to the believer to read these words, um, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And this is our assurance, um, not the blood of a lamb slain in an Egyptian household, but the lamb of God slain on Calvary for the sin of the world. And God says, when I see the blood that you have claimed um, and that you have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ and accepted his sacrifice for you, then I will pass over you. It's a, a tremendously emotional thing for a believer to think on these things, that when judgment comes, it will pass over us. It won't destroy us as the Egyptians and, the, and their livestock were destroyed at this time here in um, Exodus. So they're sent out and they say, oh, off you go, please, please go. And they bestowed all sorts of gifts on them and, and uh, get gold and ornaments and what have you. Um, and off they went. And um, they, we've, I've called this the flight, the flight from Egypt. And um, I've put uh, on the map here um, a little to help you. Um, this is uh, the Mediterranean up here and the Nile River and the Nile Delta and the Red Sea. And this he area here is where they believe the land of Goshen was, where Jacob had settled with his family and where they were growing um, a, up there as, as a shepherds and a, eventually as a makers of bricks. And one would think, looking at this map, uh, you have this roadway here effectively toward the land of the Philistines and it heads along the coast of the Mediterranean and up to Gaza uh, and then on up to Canaan, which would be the promised land. And to, to our way of thinking, if you're going to be set free from the land of Goshen and get away from Egypt uh, and head this way, this was the right way to go. There was no hindrances here other than the difficulties of the journey. Um, but God in his wisdom uh, brought them south, not east directly, brought them south down here and uh, brought them into a situation where they were trapped between the sea and the Egyptian army who by this time had decided to go and get them back. And uh, it, it was a desperate situation um, to be trapped in that way. And uh, I think uh, about the, um, the people themselves uh, despairing. Um, we can't cross the sea. And the Egyptians are right behind us. We're between a rock and a hard place. And we have no means of uh, getting ourselves out of this. And that's when God... He says, you know, I saw that there was no one to help them. So I myself stepped in. And it's this picture of God, the, uh, the Redeemer, the one who changes the situation, the one who uh, brings about um, a, a beautiful release from bondage. He says, I am the Lord, your God, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of of bondage. And, and we have that um, tremendous um, metaphor for our own faith, um, that God is the one who brought us up out of the pit, out of the darkness, and into the light and set us free. This great redeeming God has done this for us, for you and me, and we can be glad and give thanks this morning for his provision for us in this way. And so uh, God steps in and does for them what they cannot do. This great creator God divides the waters of the sea. Um, it's an impressive. It's awesome. It's, um, uh, to use a word that's used so much today, it's unprecedented. This had never happened before. And God divides the sea. And in front of the uh, children of Israel, who, want, who would be the best part of a million people now, they were able to step out onto the seabed and walk across where the sea normally sat. And uh, I don't know how they felt, 
And I think it must have been amazing to walk between walls of water and to see a, a, an opening, to see a way ahead uh, that was totally impossible. Um, but by God, all things are possible. And so they were moving across all, all of them uh, with their children, their wives, their livestock, everyone across to the other side of the Red Sea. And God's plan um, was not just to get them out of Egypt, it was to set them totally free. And so when the Egyptians went in, um, the sea closed upon them and they were destroyed. And the sense of relief amongst these children of Israel must have been amazing because not only were they out of Egypt, but they were released from the threat of being taken back. They were really free. And there was no one who was going to change that. And they're on the other side of the Red Sea. This was salvation in a huge, magnificent way that God accomplished this. So this resulted, of course, in celebration. And everyone likes a celebration. And we have um, Moses um, in chapter 15. This is where he talks about the horse and his rider. Let's just uh, look at the words there in Exodus chapter 15, which is echoed also by Miriam uh, at the end of chapter 15. <clears throat> chapter 15 begins, then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. Speaking of the Egyptian army which had been totally annihilated under the water. And Moses continues, the Lord is my strength and my song. And he has become my salvation. This is my God and I will praise him. My father's God and I will exalt him. And so he continues in, uh, we can read at the beginning of chapter 15, the rest of that song. And then Miriam um, echoes in her song the same uh, sentiment, the horse and his rider um, he has sent uh, into the sea. So we have this wonderful picture of an enslaved people and a redeeming God and a magnificent outcome. Uh, and it's cause for celebration for us too, um, as we think about how God revealed himself, this time, not to an individual, not like to Abraham or to Jacob, um, but God revealed himself through Moses to the whole people. He was making a statement that I am God and I, am, I, I have authority, I have power, and I have a plan, and I want you to know who I am. So he says to Moses, tell them this, I am has sent you, the one who was and is and always will be. Tell him that the creator God is the one who has sent you, because I love these people, and I want to redeem them and bring them out of the enslavement that they're suffering from. So there's this great revelation of God, and not only that, but within the context of the story that we've just been thinking about, um, they are given so much information about God. Some of it um, just before their eyes, his power, his authority, his plan for their lives, and his love for them were all being revealed and opened up as God made himself known in a, an, an amazing way to these uh, people at that time through his servant Moses. When we look at this from our perspective and we look back at it, <clears throat> I get quite excited um, to think about the importance of this event uh, in, so early on in the scriptures, and I was thinking of it like this, that God was using a big, big brush to paint a picture of the, who he is and what he does. 
um, the Exodus appears again and again and again throughout the scriptures. The Jewish people refer back to it time and again, remembering the crossing of the Red Sea, remembering the redemption that they experienced at that time. And uh, there are so many um, portions of scripture that uh, speak about it. And here are two. One in Leviticus, uh, still in the Pentateuch here, in Leviticus 11.45, it says, I am the Lord who brought you up out of Egypt to be your God. This is who I am. And I, because of that, and because of your experience of me, I want you to be holy because I am holy. And this revelation um, within the, not just the Old Testament, but even today, uh, Moses is a Colossus uh, in the Jewish faith. And then again in Psalm 81, verse 10, um, I love this. I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt. I want you to open your mouth wide and I will fill it. I'm a God of provision. Um, I'm the God who provides not just salvation, but I have given you already, he says, everything you need. So this broad brush, this broad picture that God paints so early on in the scriptures speaks to us of what was to come. And this is again our key theme, that everything is pointing towards the Lord Jesus Christ, to the Redeemer, to the one who would suffer and die, to the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. It's pointing all forward to that. And the, this magnificent picture that's pinned down into uh, the life of the Jewish people and remembered continually throughout the scriptures. It, within the Jewish household, um, they, they recount the story. Um, and um, it said, when your children ask you, what do these things mean? This is what you're going to say. This is how you're going to explain it. And the same emphasis would be on us too. When the children say to us, why are you going uh, to church? Why are you filled with thanksgiving? Why are you excited about worshiping God? Why is all this happening in your life? You'll be able to point to the one who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light and say, I am so happy that this has happened to me, that I have an experience of the living God who has touched my life and brought me out from an enslavement to sin and to the penalty of death and brought me into this wonderful and marvelous experience to be called a child of God, for that's who we are. And so we have a duty um, that's emphasized again in the New Testament. You know, when Paul speaks to Timothy, he says, tell, you know, keep telling others um, uh, and explaining to them the truth of the gospel, that Christ died for our sins. So we have this, uh, Ma massive picture in uh, the very beginning of the scriptures of a redeeming God who has done this amazing thing in opening a way where there was no way. And we can say too, um, we're caught between a rock and a hard place and there was no one to help us. And we were lost unless somebody intervened. And God says, As I, I heard your cry. I heard your cry. And I uh, entered into the situation and brought redemption and made a way possible. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. And we have entered into the, <coughs> excuse me, entered into that life by the grace and mercy of God. And he is able to do this through the sacrifice of his son at Calvary. So we rejoice this morning and we sing hymns of redemption and we sing hymns of salvation and we sing hymns that um, speak of the magnificence and the, and the might and the awesomeness of God himself, um, our awesome God. And so this is our uh, way forward as part of God's plan to be the ones who would carry this message to others also. So we're very thankful to have this picture in the Old Testament. Um, it's quickly um, uh, tarnished uh, as the days go on uh, for the uh, people on the other side of the Red Sea. Um, but again, the picture that's created there is very often the picture that's created in our lives too. 
that we quickly forget what God has done for us um, and uh, turn um, away instead of drawing nearer and experiencing more of the blessing of God. But God did in his mercy um, bring them through the desert, even though they never made it to the promised land. It was the next generation. So we are delighted this morning to say um, uh, glory to God um, for the horse and his rider he has cast into the sea. Glory to God because he has redeemed me and called me his own. So rejoice this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.